Hello. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this message today. My prayer is that God will speak to you through this message, that you will hear something that will help you grow as a Christian. You will hear something that will help you mature as a follower of Jesus Christ. If I can answer any of your questions, please email me. My email address is really simple. It's pepper at fbcmv.com. And again, thanks for taking the time to watch today. My prayer is God will use it in your life. Now, enjoy the message. Take your copy of God's Word. Take your Bible. Find Ezekiel. Now, I know that's not what the bulletin says, but that's where I need to start this morning. I'd planned on uh, using this passage of Scripture later on in the middle of the service, but in light of what has taken place in Israel... I need to start in Ezekiel. And so if you'll find Ezekiel chapter 36 and find verse 24. Ezekiel chapter 36, find verse 24. I'm in a series of messages, as you can see from the screens, that I'm calling Intensified. Why Israel Matters. We started last Sunday morning, and we learned that God is sovereign. He's sovereign over our world. He is sovereign over the nation of Israel. He's sovereign over our life. Basically, that is found in the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. And today, we will learn that God is, God is righteous. We will learn about the righteousness of God. And that's basically found in the 10th chapter of Romans, which is where we'll eventually be. But again, in light of what took place yesterday in the nation of Israel, I need you to understand, and I was going to use it anyway. People have asked me all morning, did, did what happened yesterday change your sermon? Well, not really. It kind of changed the introduction, but... Because I was going to show you what the Bible says in Ezekiel 36 and 38 and 39 about the nation of Israel. Then we'll springboard over into Romans, last part of chapter 9 and all of chapter 10. So, let's pray. And if you would always, I covet your prayers and so pray for me right now. Ask the Lord to speak through, through me. Pray for yourself, Lord, let me hear truth that I need to hear today. Don't let me miss anything that you want to show me from your word today. So give me a listening ear. That's what you would pray for yourself at this moment. So pray for me, pray for yourself, and I'll do the same. Let's do that. Father, thank you for the opportunity to stand and deliver your words this morning. I pray you would guide my words. Don't let me say anything, Father, that's not accurate. Speak through me your truth. And let us see, Father, not only your design and plan for the nation of Israel, but, Father, your design and plan for our own individual lives. So, Father, I pray that everybody here We'll be listening to your spirit. Nothing will distract us, them, from what you want to say. And thank you, Father, this morning for the music. Thank you, Father, for people who, who use a gift and a talent that you've given them to just encourage us. Thank you, Father, for preparation and the deliverance of encouragement today through song. Now, Father, open our eyes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When Hamas attacked Israel on October the 7th of 2023, it was historic on so many levels. It marked the, one, the largest one-day loss of civilian life in modern-day Israel's history, over 1,200 civilians 
were killed in cold blood, over 3,000 of them wounded. And then yesterday, Iran attacked Israel, 36 cruise missiles, 110 ballistic missiles, and 185 drones. Most of those were knocked out by the Israeli Defense Force. Now comes the questions. How will Israel respond to this unprecedented direct attack from Iran? Well, this morning, Israel carried out a series of airstrikes on Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. The question is then, how will America respond? Will the anti-Semitic fault lines in our own country that were revealed in the October Hamas attack only grow larger in America? What will Russia do? What will the other nations do? Do the other nations see a weakened and declining America a divided America, and decide now is the time to act. Here's what you need to watch for. You need to watch for Russia and Iran forming an alliance. Along with other nations to come against the nation of Israel. Now, why would I say that? Because that is exactly what the prophet Ezekiel said would happen. Over 2,000 years ago, this man wrote of exactly, I believe, the days that are coming. Look here at Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. And I put several passages there. They are where I want you to be. These verses that I'm about to read will tell you where Israel is is headed. Ezekiel 36 and verse 24 says, For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Now that's already happened. That happened in May of 1948. Then, verse 25 has not yet happened. Then... I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, that means after, this is yet to come. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Now that's where she's headed. That's what Israel is going to look like one day. They're going to live in the land that God had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and and, and to Jacob. They're going to live there with a new heart, a heart of flesh, a a heart in which the Spirit guides them from, from from within. But before any of that takes place, we have to go to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying... Son of man, that's, that's his term for Ezekiel, not Jesus. Please understand, we often refer to Jesus as the son of man, but in this case it's a reference to Ezekiel. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Roash, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am coming against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. What in the world is he talking about? Well, Josephus identifies Magog and Gog as the land of the Scythians. The prince would be the leaders, Rosh, the prince of Rosh, and Meshach, and Tubal. 
different, different parts of this land of the Scythians. That is now Russia. Russia now occupies the land of the ancient Scythians. So this is a prophecy concerning the nation of Russia. Look at verse 4. I will turn you about, put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, hor horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Persia, that's Iran. Ethiopia, put, that's Libya. So we have Iran, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, with all its troops. Interesting enough, that's Ukraine. That is modern day Ukraine. Gomer with all its truth and Beth Togarma. I was taught in seminary if you'll say these words real fast with authority, people will think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm getting all these pronounced right, but that's Turkey. That is modern day Turkey. So we have Russia, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Ukraine, Turkey. From the remotest parts of the north, all its troops, many peoples with you. Verse 9. You will go up. You will come like a storm. You will be like a cloud of covering the land. You and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus saith the Lord God. It will come about on that day that the thoughts will come into your mind. And you will devise an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages, I will go up against those who are at rest, that live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates, to capture spoil, to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited and against the people who are gathered from the nations, who have acquired cattle and goods, who live at the center of the world. Last week I told you, from God's perspective, Israel is the center of the world. And so this great conglomeration of nations is one day going to come and attack the nation of Israel. Sheba and Dedan. Sheba is Saudi Arabia. Dedan is Egypt. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants, notice not the armies, the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages, Tarshish is England, the United Kingdom. People ask me all the time, where is America in the prophecy of Israel? Where, where is America when it relates to Israel and what will happen in the end times? What role will America play in the end times? We're not there. I can't find us. I may be wrong. But I cannot find us. The closest is right here. Merchants of England with all its villages. We were once a village of England. So maybe, maybe that's a reference to America. Who live, I mean, Sheba, Dedan, merchants of Tarshish, with all its villages will say to you, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver, gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture the great spoil? Therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to Gog, thus saith the Lord God, on that day my people Israel are living securely Will you not know it? You will come from your place out of the remotest parts of the north. And many peoples with you. And all of them riding on horses. A great assembly and a mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. And it shall be about in the last days that I will bring you against my land. So that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you. Now here's what that means. That means that the Lord will use this attack on Israel to turn Israel's eyes to him. 
That's what's going to happen. That the nations may know when I am sanctified through you. That's the attacking nations. When through the attacking nations I am set apart and seen as the Lord God. Now, how's that going to happen? Move your eyes down to verse 22. Ezekiel 38, verse 22. With pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. I will rain on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him like a torrential rain with hailstones and fire and brimstone. Who's going to win that war? Verse 23. I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations. And they will know that I am the Lord. Now look at verse th- chapter 39. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Remember, that's Russia. And I will turn you around and drive you on and take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. And you will fall on the mountains of Israel. And you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open field for it is I who have spoken declares the Lord God. And I will set fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. And they will know that I am. I am the Lord, my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned any more, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Israel will know, and the nations will know that Jesus is King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. Is this what we saw yesterday? Are we in the beginnings of Ezekiel 38 and 39? I don't know. Some believe that this battle of Gog and Magog will occur right before the rapture. Some scholars believe this battle of Gog and Magog occurs right after the rapture. I'm kind of hoping it's before. And and if you don't believe in a rapture, you can just stay here through all of this. (laughs) Jerry Falwell used to say, if you don't believe in the rapture, don't worry, you'll get straightened out by it. But I don't know, are are, are we seeing the beginnings of Ezekiel 38 and 39? I just want you to realize that what Ezekiel has prophesied is not so far-fetched. It is very real possibility. And what else I want you to see is that we have a God who is pushing these nations around like checkers on a checkerboard. He's arranging the whole thing. And whether this is the beginning today in Israel, as I said earlier, responded with attacks in Lebanon. Whether this is the beginning, I do not know. But I do know that there is a sovereign God who is in control. And where is Israel headed? It's headed just what I read a moment ago back in Ezekiel chapter 36. It's headed to that place where you will live in the land that I will give to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. And that's what Romans chapter 11 tells us is going to happen. We'll get there next Sunday. But this morning, our task is to work our way through Romans chapter 10. I want you to understand God's righteousness found in Romans chapter 10. So now, find the New Testament book of Romans and find chapter 
Chapter 9, verse 30 is actually where we're going to start. And then we'll move into chapter 10. Now, here's what I told you last week, and I want you to remember this about what these three chapters say. Remember that Romans 9 is about God's sovereignty, and that's Israel's past. We looked at that last week. Today, we're going to look at Romans chapter 10. It is about God's righteousness, and this is a description of Israel present. Israel's present is described to us in Romans chapter 10. And then Romans chapter 11 is about God's faithfulness, and it's going to tell us about Israel's future. Romans chapter 9 taught us that in God's sovereignty, He made choices. He he chose Abraham, He chose Isaac, He chose Jacob, He chose Moses... And then he gave to Israel all these great advantages. He gave them the covenants. He gave them his law. He gave them a temple to worship him. He gave them the promises of many blessings. And then he gave them the promise of the Messiah. And the Messiah came. And by and large, Israel rejected their own Messiah. Their own Savior. So the gospel went to the Gentiles, and they embraced Jesus. And that's what chapter 9 and verse 25 says. He says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, my beloved. And verse 24 tells us that's the Gentiles. The Gentiles have embraced Jesus. And yet God has saved a remnant of Jewish people. That's 9 verse 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea. It is the remnant that will be saved. Now listen to me. There are 7 million citizens, Jews in Israel. There are 7.1 to be exact. 7.1 million Jews in Israel. There are 15,300 Messianic believers living in Israel. The latest statistic I could find comes out of 2022. And it said there are 15,300 Messianic Jews living in Israel who believe Jesus is their Messiah. They have embraced Jesus as the Messiah. And they worship in 273 different churches across the nation of Israel. Some of those churches are Hebrew speaking. Some of those churches are English speaking. Most of them are Russian speaking. And they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're the fulfillment of prophecy. 7.1 million 15,300. Dear family, that's a remnant. That's a remnant. Which leads me to say this. Here's my life point this morning. Because righteousness is given, not earned, it can be missed and not received. Look with me at Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, And he who believes in me will not be disappointed. Now here's what I'm calling this. I'm calling this a wrong righteousness. It begins by saying, by asking the question, what shall we say then? In other words, to what conclusion does this bring us? And then Paul is going to give us a summary. And here's the summary. The Gentiles, who never really sought a righteousness with God, have laid hold of that righteousness of God by faith. 
And Israel, to the contrary, who actively pursued a righteousness with God, has failed to attain it because they sought to attain it the wrong way, by their works. Jews pursued righteousness by their works. They sought to create their own righteousness as a way to stand before God. And it is the wrong way. Still is. You'll never be righteousness. Excuse me, you'll never receive the righteousness of God. You'll never be righteous trying to stand before God in your own works. You see, here's what Israel did. They stumbled over the concept that God's righteousness comes as a gift through Jesus Christ. And that's verse 32 and 33 here. They stumbled over the rock The stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, the cornerstone of Jesus. One scholar wrote, the rock has reduced Israel to a remnant. And if you move into chapter 10 with me now, Paul prays, look at verse 1. Paul prays with intense emotion for the conversion of Israel. It's not an abstract issue for him. These are people he knows. These are people that are his brothers and and these are people who are his friends and they desperately need to be saved and they have gotten it all wrong. Paul says in verse 2, they have a zeal for God. They want to honor God by performing religious duties, thinking that that performance of those religious duties is going to earn them a righteousness Before God. Notice Paul says, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. Verse 2, but not in accordance with knowledge. You and I live in a culture that says it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere in that belief. That is a lie from the pits of hell. It does matter what you believe. And so here is a group of people who had a zeal Boy, I want to know God. I want to honor Him. And so I'm going to do all of these good works. And that's going to earn me a right standing before my God. They have a zeal to honor God, but they do so without knowledge. They're sincere, but they don't believe the right things. Verse 3 says they sought to establish their own righteousness. Their self-righteousness. And they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So there's religious pride, there's self-righteousness, and and, and then there's this unyielding stubbornness that they, they will not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Verse 4 says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the end of the law. That means he obeyed it completely. And in his death and resurrection, he did away with any thought that righteousness would come through obedience to the law. He is the end of the law. He did away with the idea that through obeying the law, I can find a righteousness with God. No, it is through his death and resurrection that is made clear. I love the way Tim Keller sums this up. Tim Keller says, The ones who know the most about God did not come to know God. While the ones who knew the least about God came to know God best. The ones who wanted to be righteous ended up dead in their sins. And the ones who least wanted to be righteous ended up holy and blameless in his sight. Now that's topsy-turvy. Oh, the irony of of that. But, But let's apply it to us. I don't want to give you a lecture that you might hear in a New Testament class this morning. I'm going to give you a message. Let's apply those verses there that we have just read to you and I. Let's apply it to East Texas pickup driving bass fishing us. (laughs) 
There are religious, moral people. The woods are full of them. And there are irreligious, unbelieving people. We have our share of them as well. The irreligious, unbelieving people trample the gospel underfoot. For years they do that. And then possibly middle 20s, 30s, maybe later, they recognize their sin. They turn to Jesus. And they are saved by grace. They are given a faith righteousness from God. But the religious moral people are much less honest with themselves about their own sin and generally have a condescending attitude toward the irreligious believing folks. Their attitude is, I live right, I do good deeds, I tithe my income, I'm in church every Sunday, I try hard, so God owes me. And they miss the righteousness of God. Because they go about it the wrong way. Just like the Jews. They stumble over Jesus. You stumble over the rock. Because faith in Jesus requires that you have to lay down any idea of your own righteousness and accept God's righteousness through faith in Jesus. Jesus Christ is the rock. You will either build your life upon Him or stumble over Him. You will either found your life upon Him or you will fall over. A wrong righteousness. Let's move on. Look at verse 5. I call this a right righteousness. And a right righteousness knows that you don't have to do anything to be righteous. Look at verse 6 and verse 7. Unusual verses. Maybe hard to understand. But the righteous based on faith. Speaks as follows, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Do you know what those verses mean? Verse 6 means that Christ has come near in his incarnation, and you do not have to ascend to heaven and bring him down to earth. He has already come. And verse 7 says, Christ has come near to us in his resurrection. And you don't need to try to go to the grave and bring him out of the grave. He has already done that. Here's all you need to do to have right righteousness. Verse 9, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you will be saved. For with with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all. Abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen to me dear family. Listen to me real close, sir, ma'am, teenager. Listen to me. Verse 9 tells you, if you want to be saved, you have to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. In Hebrew, the word Lord is Yahweh. That is the personal name for God. So when you confess Jesus is Lord, you're confessing that He is God. You are confessing correctly about the person of Jesus. He's God. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That means you're believing that Jesus was crucified for your sins. And that his death paid the debt you owed. 
You're believing that Jesus was buried and that he rose again to conquer death and give you eternal life. You are confessing correctly about the work of Christ. Now, did you get that? You're confessing correctly about the person of Christ and the work of Christ. You confess this is Jesus who in his person is Lord and God. Then this is what Jesus did. This is his work. He was crucified, dead, raised from the dead. And you believe something specific about Jesus. You believe that. You believe his person and you believe his work. And the word heart here just simply means your whole self. Everything about you. Your whole self. You're not trying to rely on any efforts that you have in any way whatsoever. You are trusting in Christ's righteousness. His person and his work. That is the only way to be saved. It's the way every Jew will be saved. It's the way every Gentile will be saved. That's what verse 12 says. Verse 13. Whoever. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Call on Him. Right now. Call on Him. Jesus, You are Lord. Jesus, You died on the cross for my sins and rose again. Save me. Call on Him. And He will save you. He will save you now. Finally, this morning, the chapter closes in verses 14 to 21, and I'm I'm calling it a released righteousness. Listen to Romans Chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, it talks about our responsibilities, brothers and sisters. It talks about our responsibility to release this righteousness to others. Verse 14 says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Down at the bottom of the screen that you can see up there this morning, I wrote the words in the order that they appear. You must call, believe, hear, preach, send. You get that? It says there in verse 14, How will they call on him whom they've not believed? How can they believe unless they've heard? And how will they hear unless they have a preacher? And how can someone preach unless he is sent? Now put those in reverse order. Send. Preach. Hear. Believe. Call. You see, someone else being saved starts when Someone is sent to share the message. Someone else being saved starts when someone is sent to share the gospel. And that is your responsibility. That is my responsibility. That is this church's responsibility to send you out To send you out with a message of right righteousness. To send you out to release the good news. To go out there and have Jesus conversations. Where you work, in the shop, in the office, with your friends. You go and preach so that others may hear, believe, and then call on the name of Of Jesus. Before anyone can hear, believe, and call, someone must preach. 
And before anyone can preach, someone must be sent. That's you and that's me. And when you do that, God says you have beautiful feet. Now, I've seen some of you's feet. God may be lying. Either that or you're not preaching enough for God to call your feet beautiful. (laughs) Now, watch this. Look at verses 16 through the rest of the chapter. Isaiah and Moses saw the day. Isaiah and Moses saw the day when the Jews would by and large reject this gospel. They predicted it. Verse 16 is a quotation from Isaiah 53 chapter 1. Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 19 is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 21. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? Moses says, I will make you jealous by what which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. The Gentiles' reception of the message was to stir up jealousy among the Jews who had largely rejected the message. Chapter 10, verse 20 and 21 is a quotation of Isaiah again, this time chapter 65, verses 1 and 2. I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. That's where Israel is today. They are a disobedient and obstinate people. They are responsible for how they treat the word of Christ. They are not excused for their refusal to believe. And what does our world Look like tomorrow? What does tomorrow hold when we wake up in the morning? What will Fox News have as their headline or CNN or MSNBC or ABC or CB? What will be the headline on the news tomorrow concerning the nation of Israel? I don't know. It's not clear. But I can tell you this. God has not rejected his people. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, (laughs) God has not rejected his people. Has he? Remember, Isaiah predicted it. Moses predicted it. By and large, they have refused to acknowledge. They They are an obstinate, disobedient people. I say then, God has not rejected his people. Has he? May it never be so you want to know what's going on on God's calendar you watch the nation of Israel and you keep your Bible open to Ezekiel 38 and 39 let me close with this let's do this you can read them let me say them Let's care enough for the souls of others to faithfully share the good news. Freely, often, share the good news. Let's care enough for the souls of others to pray that the gospel would penetrate disobedient hearts and obstinate minds. Let's care enough about our own souls to make sure we are placing our faith in Jesus to give us righteousness. Because righteousness is given and not earned. It can be missed and not received.
Let's make sure, let's care enough about our own souls. Let's make sure we're placing our faith in Jesus to give us His righteousness. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for truth today. Thank you for your word. And I pray right now for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray, Father, that the challenge to be sent and preach so that others can hear and believe and call on the name of the Lord. I pray, Father, that you'll give us a boldness. And this week we'll have an opportunity to have Jesus conversations. And we'll care enough about the souls of others, Father, to share that message. And then, Father, I know we, in, in, I, I, I know these dear people, Father, I, they have friends, they have relatives who are disobedient and obstinate when it comes to the gospel. Soften their hearts. Open their minds to let them see righteousness is found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for that 15,000 brothers and sisters that are in Israel this morning. Worshiping the same. Same way we do, Father. Exalting Jesus as their Lord. I pray you'll give them a courage and a boldness for them to share the message of Christ's righteousness. Protect them, Father. Put a hedge of protection around their faith communities. And Father, whatever happens tomorrow, let us see that your hand is behind it all. And on that day when Russia and Iran come down from the north, we're just going to say, hallelujah. We're closer today than we were yesterday. Thank you, Father. It's a comfort to know that you are in control of our world. I pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching today. I trust that something you heard helped you spiritually. I pray that something that you heard in the message challenged you to be a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe for the first time, but if you already are, I pray that the challenge you received today was to walk closer to Him. If you do have questions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I would love to answer them. Please email me. My email address is pepper at fbcmv.com. If you would like more information about First Baptist Church, Mount Vernon, you can go to our website, It's fbcmv.com. You have a great day today. And again, thanks for watching.